outcomes for patients with NMD8 receptor encephalitis have not changed over the last decade. We need your help to refer newly diagnosed NMD8 receptor encephalitis patients who may be eligible to participate in the NIH-sponsored Extinguish trial. The Extinguish trial is now enrolling new NMD8 receptor encephalitis patients. To learn more, search Extinguish trial at clinicaltrials.gov or call the Extinguish hotline at 844-4-BRAIN-5. This is Jose Merino, Editor-in-Chief of the Neurology Family of Journals. The Neurology Podcast provides practical information to neurologists and other clinicians to help them provide better care for their patients. Thanks for listening and have a great week. This is Stacey Clardy and today I'm speaking with Jonathan Graf Radford. John is a cognitive neurologist at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, and his research is focused on identifying therapeutic targets for cognitive impairment and improving the diagnostic accuracy of cognitive disorders. We're going to talk about his paper in neurology. It's titled Clinical Radiologic and Neuropathologic Evaluation of Corticobasal Syndrome. John, I'm going to confess from the outset, I'm really uncomfortable with diagnosing corticobasal syndrome. I don't do it much. So sometimes I think about it and then I think I lack confidence and I'm like, no, that's not right. Or it doesn't sort of fit the box of my understanding. So I need you to help me out with some of the basics. Can we first start with the terminology? So I thought it used to be called corticobasal degeneration, but now I've noticed in your paper and in reading up on this that it's corticobasal syndrome. Is that right? Are you still using both or has it changed? The terminology can be confusing and there's really still ongoing debate about the best nomenclature to use. And you're correct. For many years, we used the term corticobasal degeneration, and that referred to both the clinical syndrome and the underlying neuropathology. But about two decades ago, several groups published autopsy series where they showed that multiple pathologies could cause this clinical presentation. And so that changed the terminology from corticobasal degeneration to what we use now, which is corticobasal syndrome. And the term corticobasal degeneration now refers to a specific type of four-repeat tauopathy. And the hallmark lesion of that tauopathy is the astrocytic plaque, which is tau positive. Okay. I think I got it. So when I'm in clinic and I'm looking at a patient in front of me, and this is coming onto my differential, I should be thinking in terms of corticobasal syndrome when I'm framing this diagnostically because I don't have that other information in front of me. Is that fair? That's correct. And the corticobasal syndrome refers to the clinical presentation of someone who's got an asymmetric disorder with rigidity, apraxia, and then there's variable involvement of alien limb cortical sensory findings, myoclonus and dystonia, as well as Parkinsonism. It's also known as one of the Parkinson's plus syndromes. That's a great way for me to frame it. I think I had always put it aside too because of what you mentioned about the alien limb. I remember that sort of being the pathognomonic thing, or maybe that's what's stuck in my head is unique about it. But this can be misleading too, right? I, I was talking to one of our movement docs who was saying the alien limb, as I had sort of been taught it or conceived it, it's actually much more subtle very often. Is that right? Is that your experience too? You don't have to have this arm just moving and no one being aware of it. What are the subtle findings? That's right. Alien limb occurs in about 30% of corticobasal syndrome cases, so it can be an important diagnostic clue. And it can be subtle. Early on, patients may just have arm levitation, which doesn't quite meet alien limb criteria, but can suggest future alien limb development. And I've witnessed this spontaneously during the history taking or more often during the gait evaluation. And because it can be intermittent, it's important to ask patients as well as whoever they bring to the appointment whether or not they've witnessed any arm levitation or whether their hand might touch things that they didn't intend to or whether they feel their arm doesn't belong to them. And sometimes patients describe someone else controlling their arm as another feature. And it's important to keep in mind that alien limb can also occur with other 
neurologic diseases. So it can be a presentation of CJD, for example. We've seen it with hereditary leukodystrophy with spheroids, as well as after brain lesions, classically colossal lesions, but also strokes. Okay, that's really helpful. And especially the part you said where it's really only in 30% of the corticobasal syndrome presentation. So I really shouldn't be relying on that as something to help me lock it in because the majority aren't going to have it, which leads me to another question. So you see these patients in these conditions as a whole regularly. When someone misses the diagnosis, you know, when this person has come to my clinic and I I knew enough to suspect some sort of Parkinsonism and, and maybe I've referred them on, what do you observe to be the most common misdiagnoses given, right? So now I'm being paranoid, like, okay, surely I've seen one of these patients, but I haven't made that diagnosis in the past few years. So I'm wondering what I might have called them. What do you see them misdiagnosed as? Early on, it can be quite hard to distinguish corticobasal syndrome from other Parkinsonian disorders. And quite commonly, people will have a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. And then they note that they're not really responsive to levodopa. And maybe they start to notice some more prominent limb symptoms like apraxia. And so those can provide some clues as to whether you're not dealing with typical Parkinson's disease. The other type of misdiagnosis we see is most often not coming from neurologists, but when other providers refer them in. So we might see people referred in from orthopedic surgery or internal medicine, and people have received diagnosis like carpal tunnel syndrome in the limb that's affected or rotator cuff injury, and even undergo procedures to try and fix these. But the procedures often don't help and may make things worse by immobilizing the affected limb. Okay. So this is helpful. I think I've got a framework now and now that I have my refresher on corticobasal syndrome. Can you tell me what did you find when you looked at the Mayo cohort of patients who, as I understand it, you looked at ones who met the 2013 clinical criteria for corticobasal degeneration? We had 113 corticobasal syndrome patients who were seen at Mayo Clinic and subsequently came to autopsy. And the primary neuropathologic diagnosis were corticobasal degeneration in the majority. And this was followed by progressive supranuclear palsy pathology, Alzheimer's pathology. And we found a subset who had a mix of Lewy body disease and Alzheimer's disease pathology. We then wanted to look at which clinical features would distinguish these various pathologies. And what we found was that the presence of myoclonus, apraxia, as well as posterior cortical signs like calculation problems were more common when corticobasal syndrome was due to Alzheimer's disease versus other causes. And in this group of corticobasal syndrome who had mixed Lewy body and Alzheimer's pathology, they actually had more visual hallucinations, which you might expect as well. The next part of the study, we looked at the neuroimaging differences between these groups, and we found that the cases with underlying Alzheimer's disease actually had pretty widespread atrophy compared to patients who had corticobasal degeneration and PSP pathology. They had much more focal atrophy in the prefrontal areas. We then wanted to look at the clinical criteria for corticobasal degeneration at presentation and evaluate what the positive predictive value was for those criteria. And we found that it was a suboptimal performance at about 61%. The most common pathologies that led to mimics were Alzheimer's disease pathology and PSP pathology. So this is complicated. That would be the summary, right? Even in the hands of experts, looking at patients who fulfilled the criteria, the best criteria at the time, these 2013 criteria for corticobasal degeneration, I think the numbers, maybe it's about half the time. Was this a pure pathologic corticobasal degeneration, right? That's right. So using those clinical criteria, we can't be confident in the underlying cause But we can say that you meet these criteria, and these are the likely potential underlying causes, and there's certain clinical and imaging tools that we can use to make us more confident in one cause versus the other. Tell me what you're doing in clinic now. 
when you have a patient in front of you now, now with this knowledge, even if I'm pretty certain they're fulfilling the criteria, it's maybe still 50-50. And I'm a patient who really wants to know, right? I really want the answer. You know, some patients kind of say, okay, it's degenerative. I can stop there. But let's say I'm that patient who's like, you know what? I need to know exactly what's going on here. What imaging and what studies are you going to recommend for me to increase the sensitivity and specificity of that diagnosis? This is actually quite a common question our patients have. They really do want to know what the underlying cause is. And so first we take a step back and tell them they have corticobasal syndrome, which can have several underlying causes. And then we apply those clinical features like myoclonus and apraxia and the imaging features like is this more of a diffuse atrophy pattern or more focal to provide some additional clues. And then we can consider additional biomarkers. So Alzheimer's disease biomarkers, particularly in the CSF, are pretty widely available. And they can tell us if the underlying cause is Alzheimer's disease. And if they have negative Alzheimer's biomarkers, it makes AD pathology unlikely, and it really increases the possibility of a four-repeat tauopathy like corticobasal degeneration or PSP. But we really need to wait until additional 4R tau-specific biomarkers become available to add additional diagnostic certainty. Is that something that's on the horizon in the near term? Well, it's actually a really exciting time. So just last year in, in Nature Medicine, Randy Bateman and his colleagues published a new biomarker in the CSF, and they measure tau fragments, which we know accumulate in the brains of people with corticobasal degeneration. And they found a specific microtubule binding region fragment that fell in the CSF of these corticobasal degeneration patients, and it really distinguished them from the other tauopathies, as well as Alzheimer's disease. And so while this was a small series, I think we may be close, and this is a biomarker with a lot of promise that we need to keep an eye on. And this, assuming that it's validated and repeated, this seems like something that might be able to be done in in the future in a clinical laboratory, you think? Absolutely. And you can imagine a case where you could measure both Alzheimer's biomarkers as well as this microtubule binding region fragment and get a real sense is this person's presentation due to Alzheimer's disease in atypical form or is it due to corticobasal degeneration with a single CSF evaluation? So this could be hopefully soon, and this would be really important, right? Because if I'm understanding your paper as it stands now, in the best hands, applying the clinical criteria, we're just not good enough to do a focused clinical trial, right? Because it's just not quite there yet without an additional marker. I would agree. I think when we apply the criteria, the underlying corticobasal generation pathology is not high enough to have a disease-modifying trial yet. But hopefully with these CSF biomarkers, as well as excluding Alzheimer's disease, we are really approaching a time when we can do a disease-modifying therapy. Wow. Well, this is really valuable. I've, I've learned a lot. And I'm feeling a bit of optimism, which is fantastic. And even if I can't still differentiate some of these very subtle things, or they're not present on the day I do my exam with the myoclonus and things like this, knowing that I can actually order a test to try to help sort this out, and that it may be important to do that because maybe there would be a trial is really a nice conversation, I think, to have with these patients in clinic. So thank you. This is important work. I appreciate you explaining it and publishing it. Thanks, John. Thanks so much, Stacey. And again, the paper is called Clinico Radiologic and Neuropathologic Evaluation of Corticobasal Syndrome, and you can find it in the journal Neurology. This is Stacey Clardy, your podcast editor. Thank you for listening and for letting us join you on your commute while you're exercising or even while you're brushing your teeth. This has been another episode of the Neurology Podcast, your best source of practical, relevant, and timely information for neurologists, clinicians, and patients.